How are you doing today? I am B and I am um, the Spinning Knitter. So welcome to the Spinning Knitter podcast. It is filmed randomly in the middle of nowhere in northeastern North America. And today is very overcast and it's very muggy at the same time. So I decided to come in and talk with you for a little bit and just show you what I've been up to since it's been a while since I got to talk to you and show you what's going on in my life. So I figured I'd start by showing you because you know how much I love books. Um, a beautiful book that I received within the past couple of weeks and it is um, well, I'll show you. <laughs> it is by Hitomi Shida, and it is the Japanese Stitch Knitting Bible. It is a gorgeous book full of beautiful stitches and uh, very well put together. It has beautiful pictures with charts, very well written charts right in front. And it also has several different types of stitch designs in it. So uh, Hitomi Shida has been um, knitting for a very long time and has been doing uh, patterns and creating stitches. And uh, she's been a part of, I know, couture knits and different things like that and is a very well-known um, and respected knitwear designer in her own right. And uh, recently, this was, I think, 2017, uh, Gail Rome, who has also just gorgeous work, um, translated this book for her uh, to be published for an English-speaking audience. So uh, this book is just beautiful. It is very heavy as well. Like, my reader's heart is happy to have my hands on this book because it's just very nice. Um, the designs in it are beautiful and they are challenging and it becomes very apparent that um, it is from a different part of the world. Uh, the world of Japanese hand knitting is uh, far more standardized than ours. They are, uh, they are much more into uh, charts than we are. Um, or than I was taught to be growing up as a knitter. And they have a standard set of definitions for stitches, which they go through at the beginning of this book explaining how to read it and uh, the expectations for the level of knitting. Uh, one of the things that they do differently is because the abbreviations are standard, you're just supposed to know what they are. Um, so, which is why they put a key in this book. And then the second thing that they talk about is the more experienced you are, um, the more ways you can come up with to achieve the same result or to make a stitch work. So uh, they point out that uh, while the trickiest stitches in the book receive the treatment of uh, drawings to better identify how to do things or um, uh, pictures, to better understand how to do things, the experienced knitter will figure, be able to figure out or know many different ways to make the stitch. And the expectation is just to make it look like it, not to use the same technique that everyone else does. Um, and in that case, they are maybe more like our adventurous knitters who just come up with stitches on their own because they tried something different to create a specific look. Um, the book is laid out uh, very well, very suited to my needs, and has different sections. So they, they have lacy patterns with bobbles, um, just straight lacy patterns, lacy patterns with leaves, lacy patterns with scallops, lacy patterns with smocking. Then they have um, overall patterns, where it is, surprise, an overall pattern. And um, get into things such as uh, crossing stitch patterns, which I find uh, gorgeous to look at and pattern panels and then they go into actually showing you how many different ways you can take a pattern panel or a specific type of stitch and rearrange it so like right here they have a basic stitch pattern which is stitch pattern 150 
in the book and it is just this pattern here and they show you how you can take it and work it into an arrangement or a design how you can do different things like this pattern this pattern is the same pattern as this however they have elongated the pattern and added bobbles so they're teaching you um, essentially she's teaching you how to create to create your own patterns your own arrangements your own stitches by taking stitches that we most of us know how to do like bobbles and um, being able to incorporate them in different designs by adding and subtracting stitches in a very um, intuitive way so after picking up this book, I decided I was going to uh, do an experiment and I had some beautiful fiber um, sock yarn from uh, Ba La Jolla that I picked up in the July 21 colorway and I don't have it with me right now, um, but I took a, a design, a stitch design that I liked from the first part of the book uh, with uh, crossing stitches and um, added in two little panel design motifs. I actually, they had two and I liked them, but I combined them together to create a new to me uh, stitch motif that runs along the side. So I will show that to you next time when I'm a little further on. Um, but it was so, uh, it was a little bit difficult to wrap my head around uh, how to meld the stitches together to get what I needed. But at the same time, it wasn't as difficult as I expected it to be because I have big feet <laughs> and everyone in my family has big feet. So I already know that I can, can mess around with a pattern to create a size that will fit how I prefer to knit. For instance, I prefer to knit on um, size zero needles. Not a lot of people do, uh, but I like the type of fabric that I get and I like the way that the sock wears because there is less chance for um, for uh, pilling and for spots to be st come stretched out and worn through. Um, I'm hard on my hand knits and so are most of my family members. I have family members that do take care of things and I have family members that trash things. Um, they don't do it intentionally. They do it because they don't understand the nature of wool and they don't understand, uh, no matter how many times I explain it, how it works. And so I have one brother, for instance, who wears my hand knit socks. And I was so surprised when I realized he would actually wear them. <laughs> but he uh, doesn't know how to take care of them. For instance, I told him, you do not put them in the dryer. They're super wash with nylon, but I told him specifically not to put them in the dryer and they accidentally ended up in the dryer. Um, now, because of the size I knit them at, he was able to still get them on his foot. They shrank a little bit, but I intentionally make his socks um, I think I'd do like 82 or 86 stitches simply so he has that shrinking room. Um, I have other family members who are a little bit more careful, but I do have another family member who shrank the uh, hand knit mitts that I made for him. And thankfully he put them on while they were wet. So he was able to kind of stretch them back out even though they had felted because those were 100% non super wool. I mean, 100% wool, um, but he didn't dry them, thank goodness. <laughs> So with all of that uh, experience behind me for knitting things for other people who know or do not know, I have come to be able to integrate different numbers easily. So I know when it comes to things like this, let me see if I can actually find one of the patterns that I used. Um, with patterns like this, ah, here's one that I sort of incorporated. So this darker picture, um, the center motif, the large crisscross section, I took that part and incorporated it into my sock because I liked the flow of um, the vines. And I knew when I took this particular part of the pattern that this stitch count, this motif was only, um, I think it was something like 16 stitches across. Well, 16 and 16 is 32, which is great, but that's only 
half the size, actually that's less than half the size that I need to make a sock that fits my foot. And then with extra cables, you have to add extra space in there because the fabric tends to be a little bit tighter with a little less give. Um, so I knew going into it, I would have to add uh, purl stitches to different places and add more motifs be to fit my foot. Now, knowing this, that made it very easy for me to cast on the right number of stitches and um, to cast on with a rib that would meld into this pattern part that I had chosen. Uh, I know a lot of other people don't have to make modifications like that. Like if your foot um, with whatever needle size you choose is always 64 stitches regardless of the pattern because that sock fits your foot, that's great. Um, my feet, it does not work that way and it does not work that way with my family's feet. So it was a learning experience, but I think it made it easier for me to be able to take this book. I don't think I'm going to become a sock designer, but I think I will become a sock recipe artist. I think I will probably um, share with people the stitch designs that I use in here, um, but let them figure it out on their own as opposed to trying to um, become an actual sock knitwear designer, which I would love to do, but I don't think I have the time or the brain space for it. So I thought I'd tell you about that. In regards to that, I tried out um, Knitter's Pride Cubix needles in the, um, I think it's the graphite needle. Don't quote me on that. But it's a uh, gray colored needle that it's out of a composite of some sort. And I really, I really enjoyed them. I was surprised. I had gotten a wooden pair um, out of like a rosewood when they first came out. And I enjoyed them but I didn't purchase them again. Um, they just didn't grab my attention compared to uh, the Chow Gu and the um, Addy needles and the uh, Crystal Palace Bamboo needles that I uh, tend to head towards. And I realized while I've been knitting on the sock and doing this kind of composition on with my hands that I really, uh, really, they have major pros and major cons for me. Um, I think the reason I didn't buy another pair before is because they are, for me, more difficult to use when um, doing a sock in a pattern that requires uh, cables of any sort. The, the squareness of the overall needle is a plus to the evenness of stitches and to the movement along the needle. I found that really delightful actually, but the, um, I loved the lightweightness of the material. I loved that they were four inch double pointed needles because that's my favorite sock size. Um, I have big hands, so the smaller needles help me not to get poked. Other, I really only use five inch needles or six inch needles because I mean, sorry, four inch needles or six inch needles because six inch needles are long enough that they don't poke me and four inch needles are short enough that they don't poke me. You give me a five inch pair, I end up with little puncture holes in my hands from trying to hold on to the needles, which I did not enjoy. <laughs> um, side note, uh, the I love to cable without a cable needle. If I can't cable without a cable needle, most likely I'm not going to finish the pattern. I know, are you like that? Because... Um, for me, for some reason, I just don't like the slowness of having to use a cable needle. I will risk dropping that stitch and having to pick it back up, which I've become an expert at, <laughs> um, just to avoid that. So is that something you do too? I don't know. Um, so I don't have the project with me, but I wanted to show you the cute project bag that it's been in or that it's going to be in. This is by Wolfiend, Emily of Wolfiend. She is on Etsy and uh, she also has her own website and this is a beautiful handmade um, koi bag and I believe she still has one more in her shop but um, this bag is perfect for a sock bag you can see it's just about the size of my face and it is lined fully lined and it, it has an inside and an outside and a perfect zipper with the very small teeth, which means uh, that are very smooth, which means your yarn does not get caught on it. And she has the, um, it's that cord that's like covered in plastic, but the really 
grippy, really grippy, really uh, shiny stuff, rubbery stuff almost. These hold up for forever and they will go through anything and even I cannot break them, which is saying something. She has just beautiful high quality bags. The materials that she uses are beautiful, but my favorite part about her bags is not only is this cute, because it's koi and look at them. I mean, who doesn't like big goldfish essentially? And these colors right up my alley. It's blue, it's gray with a pop of color me in a bag. Uh, <laughs> she has little details that just make the whole bag special. So I don't know if you can see this, but she has done a stitch design down the center for her quilting. And it just looks like she has, to me, it looks like little um, flowers, like lotus flowers going down the center and it's very simple and it adds this just touch of whimsy to this bag. And so I would highly recommend, she doesn't put up a lot of things like this, uh, but when she does go for them because they are high quality and they are beautiful and they will last for forever. Um, she dyes beautiful fiber. Her fiber is fantastic and she has such a wide variety um, to choose from all the time. I have never seen her shop empty um, unless she's going like right before vacation. She loads it up and then lets it sell out, um, which is really smart to do when you think about it. Uh, but get it. She doesn't do a lot of bags. Uh, she doesn't do a lot of stitch markers, but the one she does, super high quality. So moving on from that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about spinning and the new arrivals that I've had, the exciting things that have come to me over the past couple of weeks. I have not been a reasonable shopper. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to share with you what I've got with no shame because I know you know my heart. So I was able to pick up from Hip Strings a couple of custom blends. Um, Hip Strings is run by uh, Jill and Nick. And they have both their own shop front on the web and they also have an Etsy page and they dye fiber but they also do fiber blends so this is nymph um, all of these are the same percentage of fiber so they're 50% merino 25 Shetland 12.5 sari silk and 12.5 tussa silk and they are gorgeous so this is nymph and it's got blues and the yellow of the tussa and grays in it and the pops of sari silk. Oh, they're gorgeous. So sari silk is my favorite incorporator into anything, period, because of the flavor it gives the spinning. So that is the Nymph colorway and I'm spinning it up in one of my two separate spindles. One is my Enid Ashcroft in lined teak with a teak shaft and this is one of her minis. And I'm spinning it up quite for me, quite thickly. Let's see if you can see that. Um, so these are Turkish spindles, and it's the other one that I'm spinning up this nymph colorway on is this Enid Ashcroft. And it is in lacewood and walnut with a Zebrano shaft. It's also a mini. Ooh. Enid makes the most beautiful spindles. Um, it doesn't matter what type of wood they're out of. They're just, they're gorgeous. Um, I'm also spinning up, I got three separate colorways. So this one is Odin. Also the same percentage of Merino, Shetland, Sari, and um, Tussa. And this one is a little bit darker than Nymph, a little bit more mysterious. It has like a deep brown and um, 
probably a Shet would be considered a Shetland black. And then it also has some black and some gray in there mixed with sari silk. And my favorite part, look at that. You see that pop of bright green of the sari silk? This is what I love about sari silk. It adds those little pinches of color that are just gorgeous. So that one I'm spinning up also, surprise, on an Enid Ashcroft spindle. Let's see if I can hold this correctly. It is in Palmera with a red heart shaft. It's also a mini. And look at the way this fiber, I don't know if you'll be able to see it on camera, but look at the way that this fiber is spinning up. How gorgeous that is. It just, these little pops against the dark background of color really emphasize just, I don't know, it's just a texture thing. I love texture. So that one is Odin, and that's on my Palmera, Palmera Enid Ashcroft, but I also have this Enid Ashcroft that is going to be used with Odin, and this is a laburnum with cherry shaft. Laburnum to me is just a beautiful wood. It's iridescent. It just glows. And it's Enid, so it, it spins absolutely perfectly. And then the last blend that I have from Hip Strings that came in is this spectacular blend. Once again, in the same makeup of Merino, Shetland, Sari, and Tessa, but completely dark in flavor. It ha is all black with a touch of gray and then sorry silk. Isn't that gorgeous? Just look at that. And oh my goodness, these are, these are so soft. I just, like, look at the squish factor. Just, I'm not even pressing hard. And it's that squishy. You cannot beat that. So that, the spectacular blend, I'm spinning up on two spindles. Um, this is the one I've gotten the farthest on because I got a new to me green sleeve spindle. This is one of her uh, Marines uh, Mjolnors based off of a Nordic, old fashioned Nordic design. And you can see it is a um, very, it has a very wide top to it, but it is, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. It is so skinny, so thin. Um, this one weighs, I think exactly, this is 0.9 ounces, not one ounce, this spindle. And it's out of, uh, this is tulip wood. This is tulip wood with uh, red gum around the outside and a mahogany shaft. And this is how the spectacular blend is um, spinning up on it. Isn't that beautiful? Look at all that color in there and the texture, my goodness. Um, one of the things I love about Liz's spindles, specifically her um, Nordic range of spindles, is that they have uh, beautiful designs wherein they have these uh, very wide rim weighted spindles. Um, whim rate, whim, blah, rim weighted designs which allow you a huge cop space underneath but also mean that because they are so light they um, you can pack a lot of fiber on them. So not only do they have an amazing cop space but they have the ability to pack on a ton of fiber and because they're light you can keep spinning you don't have to adjust your spinning much as it fills up um, you're gonna get the same amount of grist per inch because of the way these are designed and that just makes me happy so I uh, was able to snag this one off of uh, Facebook uh, Liz has both a Facebook page uh, called called Greensleaf Spindles there you go and she is also on Instagram and she um, uh, the Woolery I believe it's the Woolery, also carries hers. Um, the thing you need to be aware about, about shopping on the Woolery, because I, I read a review on there that was a little bit harsh, 
um, they tell you uh, in the notes on the Woolery that the picture of the spindle that you're looking at is not necessarily the spindle that you'll receive. It is the design style of the spindle you will receive. And people get confused by that because what that means is that this is a Marines Mjolnir and this is a Marines Mjolnir. They are two completely different colors. They are uh, 0.01 ounces difference. This is 0.9 ounces and this is one ounce exactly. But they are, you could receive this one type of type of Marines Mjolnir or you can receive this type of Marines Mjolnir. Um, and people get upset with that because they think they're buying this one and then this one arrives. Now, I have not been disappointed with the spin or the quality of any of Liz's spindles that I've ever received. But if you want to know exactly what you're buying, you need to buy directly from her Facebook or from her Instagram page. Um, you can, I did have asked the Woolery and they have done this before for me. They will take a picture of, of the ones that they have in stock and they will show you, like you can inquire as to what woods. Um, I That was a couple years ago, so I don't know if they do that anymore. I now just buy from Liz directly because she's Liz and she's fantastic. Um, so just a buyer's note. It's not a buyer beware. You're still getting a great quality product. It might just not be what you thought it was going to be. So this is another Marines Mjolnir, but also by Liz. Greensleeve Spindles. And this one is one of my favorites from her that I've ever gotten. This is out of Wenge and um, spalted maple with a walnut shaft and the same type of style where you have that beautiful underneath that is just scooped out and so it's I mean this is only one ounce this spindle weighs one ounce you look at it and you think it's got to be way heavier and it's not um, and so it spins like a dream it just it keeps going you can spin these all the way to the ground it has a long steady spin um, which I like for thicker fibers. You can also spin super thin on these guys and once again they have a ton of cop space that makes life so much better than having to try to go back and forth and filling stuff up and not. So I am working through my hip strings purchases. I have plans to hopefully knit a big shawl thing. Um, you guys know merino is not my favorite fiber, but their merino for me, the way that I spin has held up. I've spun um, their stuff before. My favorite blend by them is their buoy blend. Um, that is a custom blend that only they have that comes from them, their brains, um, that they uh, have created in a mill that's nearby, and I think local to them in the Pennsylvania area. And that has uh, Zwartables, Shetland, and a couple other goodies in it. And that is my absolute favorite blend that they make. Um, but their, their Merino blends have great quality to them. Um, so I expect that uh, I could make a sweater out of this. And it would hold up and it would be really nice with how I spin. Um, but I don't want to lose, because of how I spin, I don't want to lose, sacrifice any of this fluffy. I don't want to sacrifice a single bit of this squishiness and this goodness. So I would rather, because this is for me, next to skin soft, like I can do this and I don't feel itchy at all. Which, by the way, is a good way to test if you're, you can handle wearing whatever you're going to create. Is to see if you can put it, whether it's yarn or fiber, next to your skin. Um, and as you're spinning it, to test that. Um, this will be a big shawl of some sort. A big squishy shawl. don't know whether it's going to be a hap. Uh, like a Shetland style bulky hap that I just use around the house to curl up because oh, it's so soft and squishy. Or if it's actually going to be a shawl shawl that I use for warmth because where I live it regularly gets to um, negative 20 and below. I think the um, coldest it's gotten over recent years is negative 45. I don't think it's hit colder than that. But it does get pretty cold where I live. So something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing is, guys, think about the tools that you use. Um, every spindle maker that I purchase from 
costs as much as taking a family of five out to eat. I, I realize that. I understand that. Um, but they, they are tools that will last forever. And so I would, I, I was talking with someone and they, um, basically told me that they didn't think it was worth it to invest in the tools that they have. And I want to show you something. Um, I'm not going to show you one thing because I don't want to put the maker's name across YouTube or anywhere that could be harmful to them because I think they've learned from some of their design mistakes and are now selling a much better quality product. But I want you to see this. Um, so in terms of acquisitions this week, I received an Enid Ashcroft surprise um, order. You do have to stock her updates to get things. And um, I do that quite regularly. I've gotten pretty scarily good at it. Um, but one of the things about tools is you need a quality product to make a quality product. Now this does not mean that you need the most expensive thing out there. Um, there are certain sellers that I'm sure you all know of that make beautiful and gorgeous products. I'm thinking of three right off the top of my head that every single spindle that they make is $80 or more. Um, I have a couple of those that I have gotten off of D-Stash and I have one that I purchased. I can see it from right where I'm at. Um, one that I have purchased on my own, uh, full price that um, I was very discontented with. It We did not match. I expected more. I paid um, $110 for a um, specific style of drop spindle and it's a beautiful spindle. Um, it is not what I expected and it does not spin the way that I thought it would. So we have come to the point where we are going to part ways because I tried to use it once, put it in the fiber down, <laughs> uh, walked away, had a beverage, came back, and this was after I'd become a more experienced spinner, and picked it up again, and I just, we did not like each other. And it's made out of one of my favorite woods. What's a girl to do? Um, so, long story short, I am going to, too late, I know, sorry, uh, we're going to part ways through a D-stash because it's an excellent, it's a well-crafted item, it just doesn't fit my cup of tea. Um, I go back to sellers that I do not have a problem with their products at all. Never have, never, probably never will. So this is the Enid Ashcroft spindle I received from her last update over this past week. And this is a cup style supported spindle from her. It is 32 grams and it's a Tibetan style, low whorl supported. It's out of bird's eye maple and dark walnut and it has a brass tip on the end. And this is my Aaron Makes Stuff bowl. Aaron Makes Stuff. Oh, he's one of my favorite spindle makers too and I can't recommend him to you unless you find his stuff on D-Stash because he hasn't been uh, doing spindles recently. He picked it up as a hobby and he makes these gorgeous perfect spindles. Like they don't have any sort of metal on the end and they still spin perfectly, which I find to be amazing. Um, for me, that has not happened with most of the supported spindles that I've gotten outside of Main Fiber Tools, who is no longer in business to my knowledge, which is uh, sad, heartbreaking, and heart-wrenching. And uh, Woodland work Woodworking, which if you've ever tried to get one of their spindles, you know how difficult that can be. Um, those are the ones that I uh, will talk about. <laughs> that I know have wooden ends. Um, there are some makers that make them that they do not spin very smoothly, at least not the way that I prefer uh, supported spindles to spin. So quality tools. Sorry, so much rambling. Quality tools. This is an Eden Ashcroft supported Aaron Makes Stuff Bowl. And if I do this, you and I can sit here for, I counted, 32 seconds before this thing comes to a stop. And it keeps its momentum up this consistency for the first 28. So for 28 seconds, it spins long, smooth, and for this style of spindle, fast. 
for 28 seconds. It takes it four seconds to come to a complete stop. This is a quality product. This is a product that will last me my whole life. Um, it's beautiful. There is no imperfection about it, whether it's the wood, the design, the craftsmanship, um, the finishing. Nothing about this is flawed, at least not to my hands, not to my eyes. And my eyes, as you can see, need help. <laughs> um, I invest in quality materials and quality makers. Um, first, because I like supporting small business, uh, regardless of where it is in the world, although I do prefer um, to shop in... Um, North America to help support the people around me first and then I go to um, outside sources secondly but there are a few people that I'm loyal to regardless of where they are and Enid is one because quality I don't have to flick this very hard this means my joints there is a lot less pressure on them which means I can do this for longer for one session or longer over my lifetime I don't want to develop carpal tunnel I don't want to develop tennis elbow I have a job that is very um, labor intensive and I use my whole body all day long. I know I don't look like it. I know I could stand to lose a few pounds, but I want to invest in tools that are going to help me stay healthy. And people like Enid do that. She is not the most expensive spindle maker. It is hard to get a hold of her products because her updates are small and they are um, random, but they are worth it because every single penny of this is quality. Same with Aaron makes stuff if he comes back. Uh, speaking of quality, last, last thing I'm gonna show you. Um, I have a languishing spin that I'm gonna show you out of shame and with the hopes that it will help me um, push through and finish this because I am enjoying it, I'm just not doing it consistently. So I have a ooh, loud noises. I have a braid of of um top from the wonderful Jen of Wee Chickadee. And it is her um moonflower colorway on her 100 percent Polworth base. And she is technically Wee Chickadee Wool Company. She's out of Oregon. And I cannot remember. I think I bought this off of her website. I do not remember if she has Etsy. I know that her um, updates are shopped hard and shopped fast. So if you want something, there usually is something there. But if you're looking for a very popular colorway, you need to be there when it comes out. Um, so this is it. And... Oh my gosh, this reminds me of a Wilkie Collins book, The Woman in White. I don't know why, it just reminds me of a description of something in there. Or maybe the Moonstone. And um, look at those colors. So like there's this Robin's Egg Blue, this beautiful eggplant purple that can also go like straight into this orchid purple. And then this golden tan brown bit, oh my gosh. And the prep on this braid, I don't even want to squish it. It's so nice. I have been spinning, I've been taking, um, tearing a chunk off and um, wrapping it around my finger and fluffing it just a touch to spin from the fold um, because I just like the way that spinning that way drafts for me when I'm supported spinning. And I already have one spindle that this is this is how I like to fill my supported. I've learned over the years um, that I like the space between the um, whorl and the uh, cop to be a little bit freer. Um, sometimes I will go all the way up and down. It just depends on how I feel. But for some reason, they spin smoother, steadier, and longer for me doing this. So this is a Mirkwood Arts spindle out of one of my favorite woods, which is Osage Orange. And it's still spinning, I'm gonna to have to stop it. Um, let's see if you can see the iridescence on this whorl. 
So Osage Orange is one of those woods that starts out with this deep ochre color and it's iridescent and then it deepens into a, 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 a pretty sure it's like a brown with an ochre overtone, um, but it's just, it's gorgeous wood. This is a, um, I think it's Golden Plum Mahogany Shaft. He does a lot of his with um, Golden Plum or with Maple regular maple. It depends on what the whorl is. Whatever the whorl is, he picks a complementary wood um, to go with it. He keeps almost all of his designs. This is um, Mercwood Arts on Etsy. I think Etsy is the only place he sells his. You can get his spindles. This is Tybor. He's from Maine. Um, you can get his spindles on Ravelry D stashes uh, fairly easily because people just tend to purchase a lot of his spindles and um, he has so many designs. I don't know if you could, could keep a full collection of his spindles on hand. I really don't. I think he's got over 250 designs, um, literally individual world designs. It's crazy. Um, he has a sad but um, beautiful story about why he creates spindles and I'd encourage you to go read about that in the Ravelry group and um, on his Etsy page. He is a wonderful wood turner and um, it does sometimes take a while to get his spindles. He does custom orders and each spindle is made. He's got a ready to ship page and a um, made to order page. Each one is a a perfect and they're flawless. Um, he probably has like Enid, he has a quality of craftsmanship that I just can't get over. Um, he sells every single type of supported spindle in terms of, this is more of a Russian style with uh, where the whorl is located. The other one that I'm working on the same spin with is this. It's a uh, Star Vega design in Chakta Vega with a golden plum mahogany shaft as well, which maybe you can see how gorgeous that is. So this is also, this is a very Russian style um, spindle. Uh, sorry, this is also, I mean, look at this wood. Did you, did you really see this wood? Look, look again. Just look at that. Uh, so he writes on them, one of his biggest influences is the Lord of the Rings. And he writes on them with elvish runes, which I think is totally cool. There's his name, there's the date that the item was created, and um, a couple of little fun things on there. And you can ask for this part to be um, custom burned. He, he does all of this by hand. Uh, you can ask for it to be custom burned for whatever you want to say. Um, but So he does Russian style, and then... Hold on, I'm gonna get one of his more other. More other, that's weird. Weird way to say it. Okay, so he does more um, Tibetan style spindles. So like this is Glaurung. And Glaurung is out of, I wanna say New Hampshire Black Walnut. That's where he's primarily located. Um, so this is more of a Tibetan style. You can see where the where the weight of the spindle rests with this design. Look at this. This is based off of Glaurung, who is, I believe, a dragon, if I remember my lore correctly, which most people don't know anything about lore. Anyway, moving on. I love Tolkien. Um, I don't always get everything right, but I love Tolkien. And then he has some that are, like, just heavy bottom whorl spindles. Um... This is, it's a star, and it's made out of mango. I don't remember what it's called. I'll have to look it up later. Um, but, like, this one is a heavy, heavy, just whirl and go. I found, I love heavy-weighted uh, supported spindles more than I like um, the Russian style. It just suits my style of spinning better, but Tybor's, they all have this. This is Bayorn. 
He's the shapeshifter in The Lord of the Rings. Um, if you watch the terrible Hobbit movies that were made that have great acting but really screwed up the Tolkien lore in a way that pisses most of us off, I've gotten over it. I still watch them because they're Lord of the Rings and I can't help it. Lord of the Rings style, but I can't help it. Um, but he is the shapeshifter that turns into a bear. And this is one of my favorite spindles from Tybor. And it just spins. These spin forever because they have an infinity metal ball at the bottom. It's a ball bearing. And they, the way that they work, I don't know if you can see this, but the way that they work is that tip, it doesn't matter what angle you hold your spindle at, it touches the surface. So you can literally spin at this angle if you have the right amount of surface space between the, the world design and the floor of whatever you're spinning on. And you can spin at any angle that is conducive to that and it will just spin. And it will spin at the same speed the whole way. So way more than you needed to know about spindles. But that's okay because the reason you're here is because you love spinning and spindle things the way that I do. So, I'm pretty sure that's all I have for you for today. It was a lot. I'm sorry, um, but I'm not sorry because for me, I like watching podcasts with tons of stuff in them. So, I showed you all my cool stuff for this week. And, oh, there's some sunshine. Shh, don't tell it that it's here. Um, Hopefully, I'll be able to check in within the next couple of weeks and just see how you're doing and show you any of the new fun stuff that I find. And um, I hope you're doing well. And I hope to see you sometime in person. And, uh, and hope that everything spins smoothly for you over the coming weeks. So, bye.